صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome all to the Imam Hussain Islamic Center either in person or virtually my condolences unto you all and to the Imam of our time Imam Sahib al-Zaman on the death anniversary of our beloved Imam Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam an Imam known for his Imam at such a young age and who was unfortunately martyred at such a young age an inspiration for all especially the youth Inshallah. Tonight we have Quran, Ziyara and a lecture and majlis Inshallah. I'd like to begin the program with Brother Jawad for to bless this evening with a few verses from the Holy Quran. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Muhammad Muhammad وإذا الكبور بعثرت علمت نفس ما قدمت وأخرت يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي سورة ما شاء ركبك كلا بل تكذبون بالدين وإن عليكم لحافظين كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون إن الأبرار لفي نعيم وإن الفجار لفي جحيم يصلونها يوم الدين وما هم عنها بغائبين وما أدراك ما يوم الدين ثم ما أدراك ما يوم الدين يوم لا تملك نفس لنفس شيئا والأمر يومئذ لله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أحسنت برضه جواد كان يبلي دشاء نظر لاوت صلوات for his blessings for the blessings of his parents and the blessings of his teachers صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Can I now ask uh, Hajj to continue to bless this evening with the Ziyarat Ali Yaseen, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Salamun ala ali Yaseen Assalamu alayka ya da'i Allah wa rabbaniya ayate السلام عليك يا باب الله وديان دينه السلام عليك يا خليفة الله وناصر حقه السلام عليك يا حجة الله ودليل إرادته 
السلام عليك يا تالي كتاب الله وترجمانا السلام عليك في عناء ليلك وأطراف نهارك السلام عليك يا بقية الله في أرضه السلام عليك يا ميثاق الله الذي أخذه ووكده السلام عليك يا وعد الله الذي ذمنا السلام عليك أيها العلم المنصوب والعلم المصبوب والغوث والرحمة الواسعة وعدا غير مكذوب السلام عليك حين تقوم السلام عليك حين تقعد السلام عليك حين تقرأ وتبين السلام عليك حين تصلي وتقنوت السلام عليك حين تركع وتسجد السلام عليك حين تهلل وتكبر السلام عليك حين تحمد وتستغفر السلام عليك حين تصبح وتمسي السلام عليك في الليل إذا يغشى والنهار إذا تجلى السلام عليك أيها الإمام المأمون السلام عليك أيها المقدم المأمون السلام عليك بجوامع السلام أشهدك يا مولاي أني أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدًا عبده ورسوله لا حبيب إلا هو وأهله وأشهدك يا مولاي أن عليا أمير المؤمنين حجته والحسن حجته والحسين حجته وعلي بن الحسين حجته ومحمد بن علي حجته وجعفر بن محمد حجته وموسى بن جعفر حجته وعلي بن موسى حجته ومحمد بن علي حجته وعلي بن محمد حجته والحسن بن علي حجته وأشهد أنك حجة الله أنتم الأول والآخر وأن رجعتكم حق لا ريب فيها يوم لا ينفع نفسا إيمانها لم تكن آمنت من قبل أو كسبت في إيمانها خيرا وأن الموت حاق وأن ناكرا ونكيرا حاق وأشهد أن النشر حاق والبعث حاق وأن الصراط حاق والمرصاد حاق والميزان حاق والحشر حاق والحساب حاق والجنة والنار حاق والوعد والوعيد بهما حاق يا مولاي شقي من خالفكم وسعد من أطاعكم فاشهد على ما شدتك علي وأنا ولي لك بريء من عدوك والحق ما رضيتموه والباطل ما سخطتموه 
والمعروف ما مرتم به والمنكر ما نهيتم عن فنفسي مؤمنة بالله وحده لا شريك له وبرسوله وبأمير المؤمنين وبكم يا مولاي أولكم وآخركم ونصرتي معدة لكم ومودتي خالصة لكم آمين آمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين أحسنت حج Can I ask you please recite another loud salawat for the Hajj's blessing? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Before I ask the Sheikh to come up on stage, I just want to give a reminder out that throughout the week there are multiple programs in the center. Every Tuesday night there is dua, dua tawassal at 7.30. An amazing, short, beautiful dua, 15 minutes tops. If anyone would like to make it, inshallah, 7.30 on Tuesdays. On Thursday, we have begun doing tafsir of the Holy Quran, beginning with Surah Al-Fatiha by Sheikh Muhammad Dehnavi, followed by Dua Kumail every Thursday. And considering it's school holiday, it's a very good idea to bring along your kids, inshallah, so they get into the habit of reciting these beautiful dua weekly. We also have Friday prayers every Friday during the day and inshallah every Friday evening program like we have today. If I may ask all children four years to 13 to go upstairs as there are classes on if you would like to attend upstairs. Now can I ask that we all recite a loud salawat as we welcome Sheikh Muhammad Mahdi to begin tonight's program. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم العنا ولا ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم العنا العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم العنهم جميعا ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآله وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين Previously we discussed on the birth of this holy imam a certain dialogue that took place and today or tonight we'll mention a similar dialogue and I'll explain when we get to the point of where we enter this discussion. Tonight we're commemorating the martyrdom and death of the ninth holy Imam, Al Imam Muhammad ibn Ali Al Jawad Al Taqi, 
who is known in narrations when you read as Abu Jafar al Thani. Because Abu Jafar al Awwal, the first one, Abu Jafar, when you see that, is Al Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al Baqir. So Muhammad ibn Ali al Jawad is called Abu Jafar al Thani when we read in narrations about him. In fact, one of the biggest discussions that's always mentioned on these nights is his youth and his age of when he became imam. And usually that's the discussion that's always mentioned. However, he was born, we mentioned, several weeks ago because we did uh, the commemoration was even longer, it wasn't civil, it was before Shah Ramadan al-Mubarak, it was in Rajab, um, where we did the, um, see how time's flown, I've, I've, I've lost track of time. And there's many narrations on his birth, but generally we go with the 10th of Rajab, and that's when we celebrated, of uh, 195 after Hijra. And his martyrdom, Allah is usually pinpointed to the last days of the Al-Qa'da and sometimes even mentioned as the fifth or the sixth of the Al-Hajjah because of the amount of security and injustice. When I say security against you know, spies and that, that were around the Imam not allowing people to have access to him. That people did not have a full understanding of what took place there. And his life is so tragic. Why? Because you think about the Imam was martyred at 24-25. 24-25 for most of you is what? And we say Ba'du Shab, still the youth. Some people haven't even they probably finished their degree and they've gone on to, if they're going for their masters, some people, they've got a trade, they're probably in their second year of their trade. It's a very young age. Many aren't even married by that age. It was so young that when, in one of our narrations, that Kalim or Kulaim, Ibn Amran, Asks the Imam al Rada. He says, Ask Allah, Ado Allah, and Yarzukuka Walad. He says, Do to Ad Allah gives you a child. Taba, when we use the word Walad, it means son. But he asks for a child in general. Then the Imam lets him know. He says, Innama. He says, إِنَّمَا أُرْزَقُوا وَلَدًا وَاحِدًا وَهُوَ يَرِثُنِي He said, I will have one child, and this child will bequeath me. This child will inherit from me. Not inheritance as in when we give inheritance to our children. No. يَرِثُ الْإِمَامَ He will inherit, he will bequeath the imama. He's the next imam in line. Then Kalim ibn Amran narrates when the Imam had hit the child, when the child was born. He says, قَدْ وُلِدَ لِي شَبِيهُ مُوسَى ibn Amran فَالِقُ الْبِحَارِ He says, I have a child that looks like Musa, the one that split the sea. And he says, وَشَبِيهُ عِيسَى ibn Maryam قُدِّسَتْ أُمٌ وَلَدَتْهُ قَدْ خُلِقَتْ طَاهِرَةً مُطَهَّرَةً Emphasis here on the mother of the Imam al-Jawad that he says he is like Isa ibn Maryam whose mother was purified. His mother is like this. His mother is purified. This is to emphasize that the Imams are not just from anyone. 
Because as we know, Imam al-Jawad was married to who? So, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Imam al Rida alayhi salam, who his mother was, we mentioned on the birth of Imam al-Rida's birth, and who his mother was, and Imam al-Jawad's mother was also a purified woman. But Imam al-Jawad was married to who? One of the wives, the one that was forced upon him to marry was Umm al-Fadl, the daughter of Ma'moon. Ma'moon al-Abbas. When we say Ma'moon, this is his title. Al-Ma'moon Billah. I mentioned this once before that we're given these titles. There was Muhammad al Amin, they called him. Aminullah. Muhammad, the son of Harun, was called Aminullah. He was trusted by Allah. This is the title they gave him. These were the Abbasides, the most brutal tyrants in history, and they gave themselves these titles. And they all had these titles. And I've mentioned this before that one person once heard this. He said, Why isn't any of them called Na'udhu? Billah. You know, with these titles that they gave themselves. Al Ma'moon was Abdullah ibn Harun. This one was another one that he named Muhammad, Abu Ishaq, Muhammad ibn Harun, and his name was Al Ma'tasam. He was the brother or the half brother of Ma'moon. Was the caliph that was entrusted with doing away with the ninth holy imam. Now, the daughter of Ma'mun was forced upon him. So here the imam is saying that, to let you know that an imam is from a purified womb, not just anyone. Then he begins to eulogize. This is tragic. The imam begins to eulogize his own son when? A birth. Imam al-Rada alayhi salam is eulogizing his own son. You think about this. When someone is born, you have a child, all you're thinking about is what? Their mustaqbal, their future. What am I going to do with this child? What's their future? Even when a woman is carrying a child. How many things are people doing before the child's born? Now they have so much information. Back then they didn't know. It was a kinder surprise. They didn't know what they were going to get. Now they get these, they find out with an ultrasound what they have. They're doing these, what are they called, the reveals. And then they're doing these baby showers. And then they prepare the room. Everything's getting ready. Why? Because they prepare the future of the child. They're working on what am I going to do for the future of this child. Ya Ali ibn Musa radha salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. When he mentions this child, he says, while he says, Kalim ibn Imran says he is rocking his cradle as he's saying this, he's just born. He said, Yuqtalu ghasban. Imam al Jawad will be killed. Ghasban. He will be killed in a way they will. Take his life, it will be basically, it's something that's taken from him. They will steal his life in his youth. He says, فَيَبْكِ لَهُ وَعَلَيْهِ أَهْلُ السَّمَاءِ يَبْكِ لَهُ وَعَلَيْهِ The celestial beings will weep over him. This is the angels and the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal that surrounds the heavens will weep over him. And then he says, وَيَغْضَبُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ عَلَىٰ عَدُوِّهِ وَظَالِمِهِ فَلَا يَلْبَثُ إِلَّا يَسِيرًا حَتَّى يُعَجِّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ إِلَىٰ عَذَابِهِ الْأَلِيمِ وَعِقَابِهِ الشَّدِيدِ So what's he saying here? He says that these ones that will kill him, he says they anger Allah. They are the enemies and the oppressors and they will not remain for a long time after they do this. 
And they all had the worst. The only time I've ever seen a dua like this is with regard to Imam Hussein a.s. Where the wrath upon them came during their life and off to the fire of hell. Who killed Imam al-Jawad? It was a triumvirate. Three conspirators together. One, Al-Mu'tasam al-Abbasi. Abu Ishaq Muhammad ibn Harun, the half-brother of Ma'mun. He was the main player in this game. He wasn't old. He was about 36 years old at the time. 36, 36. Probably about between 36 and 38 at the time. There was his niece, the daughter of Ma'mun, Umm al-Fadl. She was the, basically the main player. She was the one that would give the poisoned grapes. Imam Jawad liked grapes. She is the one that gave him. Imagine his wife. Imagine, you know, sometimes people complain about their spouse. You know, someone complains about the husband or the wife. I go, you complain about your spouse? The imam was living with a murderer in his house. A murderer. A black widow was living in his house. She poisoned and the one that assisted her in this manner was Ja'far ibn al-Ma'mun, her brother. Each one was done with early or in different ways. Ja'far ibn al-Ma'mun fell into a well and broke his back in the well. But he didn't die. He remained there. No one found him and he died in that state. Unable to call for anyone, or unable for anyone to hear him, even if he called, until he died. As for Umm al Fadl, her death was so humiliating. She was inflicted with an illness, an illness in the most sensitive part in a female's body. And every doctor and every person that knew any kind of medicine because she kept looking for a cure, she would be uncovered in front of them. And when I mention this to people, people say, and, and a shaykh, a shaykh yudhkar. I was, I was getting a, a test, uh, a blood pressure test last week. I went to go see a doctor and he had a, like a triage. You know, there's nurses you have to see first. You know, in hospitals, but this doctor had a triage in there. So I went in there, and, and it was a nurse. She came, and I said, look, before you do anything, you wear gloves. You know, because you might accidentally touch my arm when you're putting the... So then she said to me, why is that? I said, because it's my religion. She said, what religion are you? I said, I'm a Muslim. She said, Muslims don't ask for this. I said... I said, that's not my business, what people ask. And, and, you know, people might be surprised. I remember remember when they were selling the vaccines and one of the so-called sheikhs was showing himself being vaccinated and the woman was touching him with bare skin and, 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 and he was just sitting there happy as Larry. I don't know why, but that's the situation that was there at the time. This isn't an emergency procedure. So when I say to people that she was being uncovered in front of men, some people say, well, that's normal because people go see doctors of the opposite gender all the time for menial things. You know, sometimes in an emergency, in a different situation, everything has its own situation, there are different rulings. But that's what she was put into this place. As for the Ma'tasam, he died in his 40s. He died young. He didn't get to rule like the others and remain and he didn't, he wasn't killed. He died of natural causes. But when he died, he was ill for so long. And then he said on his deathbed, and you'll see this a lot of tyrants say this when they die, things where they show regret, but it's too late. He said, had I knew this was my end, I would have done other than this. You know, what a way to go. You know, when someone fights for something, 
someone fights for power. One example, a good example, remember in Egypt when Mubarak fell and uh, before Sisi came in, there was a guy called Muhammad Morsi. How long did he last? He came in, he must have thought, yes, a new era, I'm going to rule for 40 years. No, you don't know. Moments and your time comes and it ends. So, until the Imam would die on 220 after Israel. Last time I mentioned, we mentioned a discussion between Yahya ibn Aktham and Imam al-Jawad. Imam al-Jawad al-Jawad was young. And Yahya ibn Aktham, I mentioned what kind of, if you remember... A few months ago, I mentioned what type of person he was. He was a person that was a mutakallim. He was a judge, a mutakallim. He was a scholar, and he was someone that was very good with rhetoric and talking. So he was someone that was very deceptive with his speech. His questions were multi-pronged. And he always had some ulterior motive in his questioning. And when he questioned Imam Al-Jawad in the last discussion, it was regarding what fiqh jurisprudence. When he asked him what is the ruling for someone that hunts in Hajj. And that story. But in this case, he was questioning our fundamentals here. In what his questions were regarding politics and the science of hadith. So he was put in a position to ask these questions. Now when he's asking the questions, you might listen to the questions and think, yes, I can give the answer, but I need to explain who he's sitting in front of first. He is sitting in front of the court of Banu al-Abbas. Historically, you will not find more brutal people that ruled the earth, the Islamic world, with regard to the enmity towards Ahl al-Bayt and the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. We're not saying they were the worst of God's creation. They are worse than them. But they were the most brutal. It's like, for example, I always like to use contemporary examples. When someone comes up and says to me, is Saddam the worst tyrant? I said, yes, he's the most brutal. But he's not worse than those that supported his power. They're worse than him. But I would rather live under their government than his. Do you understand what I mean? So they're worse. Why? Because they're the ones that instigate the problems. And then they stand and pretend they're doing nothing about it. You know, they've they got nothing to do with it. But they're the ones that basically let the wolf loose amongst the sheep. and But they stand at the gate. But they're the instigators. So the ones that instigated all this are the cause of these people in power. However, the imam is put in a position where he has to answer questions that are of utmost difficult, difficulty to answer. Why? Because you are answering in front of people that are waiting for a single mistake to pounce on you. Today, you have people giving their opinion everywhere because they're in safe zones so they can talk. Back then, there was no way in the rule of Banu Abbas that was even close to being safe. Imagine, I mentioned that if someone at the time of Harun previously... <coughs> I mentioned this. Some of the time Harun was to name their child Ali. Ali. They wouldn't dare to do this. If they would, they would be accused of Tashayyuh. That you are Rafadi. And being a Rafadi today is not, it's not, even in Saudi Arabia, it's not problematic. You know, the people living there, they don't get hunted down because of this. Compared to what Banu al-Abbas used to do. Banu al-Abbas, Harun, used to bury the followers of Ahl al-Bayt between walls 
used to bury them alive. If you read the way he used to massacre them, there's a whole history into this. So Yahya ibn Aktham says to him, Ma taqulu ya ibn Rasulullah. Look at the way he talks to him. Oh, son of Rasulullah, what do you say? Fil khabar alladhi ruya annahu nazala Jibra'il ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. What do you say about the news or the, the hadith that Jibra'il came down upon the Prophet and said, Ya Muhammad, Inna Allah Azza wa Jal yukri'uka salam wa yakulu laka sal aba bakrin hal huwa anni radin fa inni anhu rad. He said that Jibra'il, what do you say about this hadith, O son of Rasulullah? That Jibra'il came down upon the Prophet and said that God sends his salam to you and says that I am pleased with Abu Bakr. Can you find out if Abu Bakr is pleased with me? Do you imagine like God, the creator of the heavens and earth? You know, can you imagine like, you know, like a guy's in love with a girl, a girl's, she wants to know if he loves her or not. You know, does he actually love me? I'm in love with him. Does he love me? You know, God is worried. You know, this is probably why Allah sent him one and all. He's having sleepless nights, not knowing if Abu Bakr is pleased with him or not. But here's the problem: Is Abu Bakr pleased with him or not? You're not asking someone like we are sitting now in Imam Hussein Center, Imam Hussein Islamic Center, where we can discuss these things. This is the court of Mahmoud. So the Imam begins with Mudarat 101, Taqiyy 101. He says, Lestu bimunkirin fadla abi bakr. Just to begin, disclaimer, I'm not someone that denies the virtue of Abu Bakr. Just to begin. So I'm about to give it, you know, when someone's about to say what they really think, they say, with all due respect. So the Imam's saying, with all due respect. He says, Walakin, look at the way he teaches. It's good for us to, to understand, this is the way we're supposed to teach. He says, Walakin yajibu ala sahibi hadha al khabar. An yakhuda mithal al khabar al ladhi qalahu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi fi hajjat al wada'ah. That the one that bought this hadith or had this news has brought it forth, it's, it's obligatory upon them to listen to what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi said in his final pilgrimage. What did he say? This is a hadith. That's where this is a hadith mentioned by Ahlul Amma, by those that call themselves Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah mention this hadith. He says, قَدْ كَثُرَتْ عَلَيْهَا قَدْ كَثُرَتْ عَلَيَّ الْكَذَّابَةِ وَسَتُكْثُ وَسَتَكْثُرُ بَعْدِ There's so many liars that give news from me or say hadith from me. And it's going to increase in how many liars will speak. So he gives us a guideline. He says, فَمَنْ كَذَبَ first, عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ So whoever lies, narrates a false hadith from me, متعمداً, deliberately, they know it's a lie and they say it. He says, let them prepare for themselves, for their place in the fire of hell. This is where they should be ready for this place. Then he says, فَإِذَا أَتَاكُمْ فَإِذَا أَتَاكُمْ الْحَدِيثِ عَنِّي If any of you, this is for you to learn. If you hear a hadith on Rasulullah, صلى الله عليه وآله, فَعْرِضُوهُ عَلَى كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّتِي You get a hadith, the Imam is saying this, this is what the Prophet has said. Compare it with the Book of God and the Sunnah of Rasulullah, the tradition of Rasulullah. 
He says, فَمَا وَافَقَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّتِي فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا خَالَفَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّتِي فَلَا تَأْخُذُوهُ فَلَا تَأْخُذُوهُ بِهِ So whoever agrees, whatever hadith agrees with the book of God and my tradition, accept it. Whatever doesn't, don't accept it. He's not talking to anyone in general. But before I go forward, this is for you to understand. I need to understand the book of God and the tradition of Rasulullah. Not just say, oh, well, you know, you tell someone hadith, but he says to you, hey, man, but I don't accept this. I won't accept this. Is, this is not right. You say hadith, especially when you talk about a fadila for Ali ibn Abi Talib. You speak of virtue of Ali ibn Abi Talib, they say, Takhanta, you know, where'd you come up with this? I can't accept this. No, he's mentioning a hadith. That the Imam is mentioning a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is mentioning a hadith. If a hadith is being mentioned about them, that does not agree with the book of God and the tradition of Rasulullah, then they do not accept it. Then, listen, see how see the method in which he speaks now. He was sharpening the knife, now the kill. He says, وَلَيْسَ يُوَافِقْ هَذَا الْخَبَرْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ This does not agree with the book of God. That Allah wants to know if Abu Bakr is pleased with him. He says, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ We created, God says in the Quran, we created the mankind and we know what whispers within themselves. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Allah says, we are nearer. Allah is nearer to you than your jugular vein. Why does it mention حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ? This is the wari'd. You ever heard min al warid il al warid? When then someone says, if they do be hamina al warid il al warid, from this to that, from that jugular vein to that one. Because you know, with these, they're very, you know, if you cut them, what happens to the vein? Shrinks up towards the brain, it shoots, it goes up. This is, where you, this is why people get killed from this. So he says, I'm closer, I'm nearer to you than this, Allah says. He says, if Allah is this close, he says, he says, فَاللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَالُ خَفِيَ عَلَيْهِ رِضَاءُ أَبِي بَكْرِ مِنْ صَخَتِهِ حَتَّى سَأَلَ عَنْ مَكْنُونَ سِرِّهِ He said, does Allah not know if Abu Bakr is pleased with him or angered with him? That he has to ask about it? Isn't Allah closer to us than our jugular vein? He says, هذا مستحيل في العقول This is impossible. How can you even accept this? So notice the Imam got rid of a hadith in a very intelligent way. This he's taught us firstly. Number one, not to enter the politics they want you to come into. You know, when you debate with someone and you say an opinion, you say they say something, they say, Do you um what do you think of this person? Whenever someone asks you what do you think of this person, and you know that they love this person, they're trying to drag you into deep waters. Don't go there. Or they want to, if you say when someone says, brother, you heard this before, he comes up, says, brother, why do you Shia curse the Sahaba? Have you heard this before? A lot of people, when they get into this point, they don't know what to say. You're supposed to turn around and say, no, brother, you curse the Sahaba. You say the Prophet's father is a kafir. You say the Prophet's mother is a kafir. Halima Sa'diyah, the witness of Rasulullah, is a kafir. This is what you say. You say Abu Talib, the protector of Rasulullah, is a kafir. You're the one that curses. Put it back on him. He's the one coming to accuse. Put it back on him. And when he tries to protect, when you want to question Aisha's actions in Basra and fighting the Imam of her time, they say, oh, she's the wife of the Prophet. No go zone. You say, well, Abu Lahab, 
was the uncle of the Prophet, but God curses him in the Quran. Abu Talib, who you call as a kafir, is the uncle of the Prophet too. You've got, you know, you've got no immunity because you relate to the Prophet. Without needing for you to get up and start cursing and bringing the house down on the head. Just tell them, what do you think? From this point. So then he jumps to another question. He says, قَدْ رُوِيَ أَنَّا مَثَلَ أَبِي بَكْرٍ وَعُمَرْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَثَلِ جِبْرَائِيلٍ وَمِكَائِلٍ فِي السَّمَاءِ There's another hadith that they have. He says, what do you think about this hadith? This is the parable, the example of Abu Bakr and Omar on the earth is like the example of Jibra'il, Gabriel, and Mikael and Michael in the heavens, the angels. Just like the example. Jibra'il and Mikael in the heavens. So he puts him in a quest situation because he wants him to let be known what the believers believe in. So the Imam says, وَهَذَا أَيْضًا يَجِبْ أَنْ يُنْذَرْ فِيهِ We need to also examine this. He says, لِأَنَّ جِبْرَائِيلِ لِأَنَّ جِبْرَائِيلِ وَمِكَائِيلِ مَلَكَانِ لِلَّهِ مُقَرَّبَانِ لَمْ يَعْصِيَ اللَّهَ قَطْ وَلَمْ يُفَارِقَ طَاعَتَهُ لَحْظَةً وَاحِدًا he said, we need to analyze this. Why? Because Jibra'il and Mikael are what? They're angels of Allah. They are near angels. In proximity, they're close. It means they, uh, they're not just any kind of angels. You're talking about the elite. Jibra'il is the elite. Aminullah. He says, and they do not disobey Allah, not even for a moment. And he says they do not depart from the obedience of Allah, not even for a single moment. Wahuma qad and then he says Wahuma about Abu Bakr and Umar Qad Ashraka Billahi Azza wa Jal wa in Aslama Bad Shirk Fakana Akthar wa Yamihima Ashirku Billah. This is something Ahl Sunnah Jama'a agree with. He says that Abu Bakr and Umar were mushriks. They say this. Then they became Muslims. Isn't that what they say? They were mushrikeen, the polytheists, they became Muslims. He says, even if, say we say they became Muslims, as you said, even this is mentioned or intended, he says the majority of their lives they were mushriks. He's teaching everyone around the reality of the situation. Because this has to do with politics. So you need to understand why is it? Here's a question. People ask why is it people can't look back historically and say, okay, yeah, jama'ah, Imam Ali was a rightful khalif. Yeah, his khalifat was usurped. Have you ever thought about that? Why can't people just concede, okay? Let's end it all so we don't have any more enmity. Imam Ali was a khalif. See, because the situation is not set in history. It's set today. If we concede that only a righteous person can rule, then all the Arab world will topple. Because they push the premise, what? That obey the one in power. Whoever's been put in power, you must obey. If we tell them Ulul Amr means the Ahlul Bayt, Salawatullah alayhi, we've destroyed everything. So they can't have an Islamic government where they put a king to rule. It doesn't work anymore. They have an issue. They have problems there. And they can't accept that. So they need to keep the status quo. It must stay that way. And this is why the Abbasides... We're pushing to see, is he against the way our rulership is? And Imam Jawad knew how to answer there. So then he says, 
تتأشرق بالله في most الله فمحال أن يشبههما بهما He says it's impossible for us to compare the two. Abu Bakr and Omar with Jibra'il and Mikail. Because it's different. So then Yahya ibn Akhtham didn't finish. He pushed it one more notch. He says it also says that Abu Bakr and Omar hadith that they are Sayyida Kuhuli Ahl Jannah. You heard this before? That they say Abu Bakr and Omar are the masters of the old people of paradise. You know, as if there's a geriatric ward in Jannah. You know, so we, we have to go, all right. You know, it's like they're off to retirement. There's a retirement village in, in paradise. فَمَا تَقُولُ He says, what do you say about this? He says, وَهَذَا Imam Salam Allah alayhi says, وَهَذَا الْخَبَرْ Muhal. See, before, if you notice, the Imam was saying, let us analyze this or let us inspect this. Now, the wheels are running at full speed. He goes, well, muhal. this is impossible. There's no need to come in soft. He's already made the meat tender. He can start hitting away now. He says, لِأَنَّ أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ كُلَّهُمْ يَكُونُونَ شُبَّانَ could you imagine right now where if they told you right now they're going to put you in heaven? How many people say, listen, can I go in? You know, when I was 90 years old, they were the best years of my life. Can you put me in there? You know, when my hip would come out, my knees would pop. No one wants that. Everyone wants when they were youthful. You remember when you were a kid and you used to fall and you just wipe your knees and keep running? You know, injuries didn't mean anything. Everything just keeps Moving, you always chugging along. Remember when the winters, when your bones didn't hurt? That's what people want. They want the good days. Who wants to go in? You know, no, God, I know, yes, I looked good. You know, I was young then. No, no, but I like being old. Put me in there really old and fragile. Just put me in like that. So he says, everyone's going to be young. وَلَا يَقُونُ فِيهِمْ كَهْلٌ وَهَذَا الْخَبْرُ وَهَذَا الْخَبَرْ He says وَضَعْهُ بَنُوْ أُمَيَّ Notice what he says. He says this hadith. Everyone's going to be young. And this hadith was bought by who? He says Banu Umayyah. Why did he say this? What does Banu Abbas think of Banu Umayyah? They hate Banu Umayyah. They're the ones that destroyed Banu Umayyah. So he said this is from Banu Umayyah. He said لِمُضَادَّةِ الْخَبَرَ الَّذِي قَالَتْ Counter what? What Rasulullah said, Al Hasan al Hussein, Sayyidi Shababi Ahl al Jannah. Because um, Rasulullah said, Hasan al Hussein are the masters of the youth of paradise. Hasan al Hussein, alayhi, did they die when they were youth? No. They went on in their years. Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, when he was martyred in Karbala, he was a grandfather. Yet he is the master of the youth of paradise. So the Yahya has got nothing else. So he says, what do you say about the hadith? I'm going to try and go quicker so I don't overstep my, my boundary. I'm closing on 40 minutes. How, for, how long do I have? Five minutes. I'll wrap this up. Then he says, what do you say? So I like to read the Arabic text, but because I've got to run it. He says, to you, what do you say about the hadith that says that Omar is the Siraj in paradise? Siraj means the lantern. When we say Siraj, it means he is the one that illuminates paradise. He says, what do you say about this? And once again, the imam said, this is impossible. In paradise, there are angels there is Adam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he said, and the remainder of the prophets and the messengers, he says, and does paradise not get illuminated with their nur? Could you imagine that the prophet's nur was insufficient, that you needed someone else? So he says, impossible on that basis. Now there's other reasons, but they're not going to give the other reasons. You know? 
Okay. We won't go there. But anyway. Then he mentions, what do you think about where it says, a sakina? Tantuk ala lisan Omar. That sakina. Okay. When we say sakina, we're talking about tranquility, sukun. He says, well, you know when someone speaks, they give you guidance. This is where they give you tranquility. He says that this tranquility, this guidance comes from the tongue of Omar ibn al-Khattab. What do you say about this hadith? These are all hadith that are mentioned by them. And then he says, لَسْتُ بِمُنْكَرِ فَضْلِ Omar. I'm not someone that rejects the virtue of Omar. Notice the way he speaks. He says, وَلَكِنْ أَبَا بَكْرِ أَفْضَلْ مَنْهُمْ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ Because this Ahl sunnah if you ask who's better, Abu Bakr or Omar? They say Abu Bakr. So he said, if Abu Bakr is better, and Abu Bakr says, I have a devil that deviates me. In fact, he says, and I want to read it. He says, Inna li shaytan. He said this on the mambar while he was preaching to the people. Inna li shaytanan ya'tarini. He says, I have a devil that, what does he do? He influences me, he talks to me, moves me left and right. فَإِذَا مِلْتُ فَسَدِّدُونِي So he says, if you see me deviate or move, bring me back to the right path. Abu Bakr is saying this. And he's supposed to be better than Omar. They have Omar has this sakina, its guidance, tranquility, comes from his tongue. Yet the one better than him can't keep his devil in check. That's what the Imam is saying. He says, um, so he says, so how could this be the case? So Yahya jumps to the next one. And he says that the Prophet once said, if I wasn't sent, Omar would have been sent. See, they, they give in all these hadith. And then he says, the book of God is more truthful than this hadith. Because the book of God says, وَإِذَا أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحَ Allah says, and this verse is a very important verse, because this verse proves that Rasulullah received this nubuwa before anyone else, before any other prophet. This verse in the Quran. He says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ Allah, He says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ that Allah gave an agreement, a covenant with these prophets. Is Allah someone that breaks his covenant? The Imam says. In other words, Allah already knew who the prophets were. But how do we know the prophet was first? He says, وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوح. نُوح, before Nuh you received this, that you were the prophet. Before Nuh. So would God say, hold on, all right, I made my agreement with Rasulullah, but I'm going to give it to Omar instead. So he said, this is impossible. And then he says, because the majority of Omar's days, he was a mushrik. He says it again, just to keep this in mind, to push the idea through to them. And then Yahya says to him, That the Prophet also said that when the wahi was, you know, when it was delayed, I was afraid it would fall on someone from the family of Khattab. He didn't actually mention the name this time. So he says if it was, so in every way he was trying to get through. And then he said, what kind of, the Imam said, what kind of a Prophet doubts in his prophethood? So if Rasulullah was doubting his prophet, then he wouldn't be a prophet. He's got, imagine like, let me explain what I'm saying here. Imagine I'm trying to bring you towards Islam. And I'm telling you, I'm supposed to be a prophet. I'm a person, I'm supposed to be a prophet. And I say, come this way. I am the prophet of God for you to follow. I think I'm the prophet of God. But you know, but sometimes when that revelation Jibrail takes a while to get, I think it's going somewhere else. How are you going to take my words? How would you accept what I'm saying if I'm unsure of the wording that I am saying to you? 
And then the final one. Notice from bit to bit. He said, what do you say about the narration that says that the wrath of God, if it falls upon my people, will punish everyone? And the prophet saying this, except Omar. So even the prophet will be punished, except Omar. And then once again, the imam says, this is contrary to the book of God. Allah says in the Quran that Allah says, لا يعذبهم. Allah, He says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ Let me get let me the verse right, sorry. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبُهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah says in the Quran, He would never punish the people. While Rasulullah is amongst them. And he would never punish them while they do istighfar. Two things prevent the wrath of God. Those two things, not one of them says Omar ibn al Khattab. So if the wrath falls down upon the people, he said everyone will be punished except Omar. What is the Imam saying here? These people that you've been pushing, Abu Bakr and Omar, to be, you know, when they mention Sahaba, they always mention the grace. These are just ordinary people they were mushriks they came to the path just like others did with them and then taban the imam's giving islam first level he hasn't given him he hasn't gone deep with this guy yet because slowly slowly when we work with people he's giving him right at the basic level if you look at it from a base let's look at it from uh uh if we say an academic perspective Abstract, without us delving into what we really know about some of the companions. What are we looking at here? We're looking at two ordinary men that you people have manufactured narrations about them. Where they could be counted with the book of God. And this is how you counter these things. Is this the way you counter it? Do you get up and start cursing? And slandering and attacking. This is the way that you're supposed to counter the way that the Imam Salawatullahi wa sallam says. There's a measures to come up, inshallah. Brother Muhammad Naki will be the one that does the dua after after the measures. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept all of your actions. We barakat salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Aflaman salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallallahu alayka ya Rasool Allah. Sallallahu alayka ya Sayyidi wa ya Mawlai ya صلى الله عليك يا سيدتي ومولاتي يا فاطمة سيدتي نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا أهل بيت النبوة وموضع الرسالة ومختلف الملائكة ومعدن العلم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا محمد الجواد عليه السلام السلام عليك يا أبا جعفر محمد بن علي البر التقي الإمام الوفي 
السلام عليك أيها الرضي الزكي السلام عليك يا ولي الله السلام عليك يا نجي الله ورحمة الله وبركاته We gather tonight to commemorate Imam Muhammad al-Jawad, the ninth Imam of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam, one of the youngest Imams who was young when he became the Imam and also young when he was martyred. Although he lived such a short life, he well and truly left his mark with some exemplary qualities and characteristics. And the Muslims at the time were truly at a loss for his martyrdom. His knowledge, his worship, his supplications, his asceticism, his generosity, doing good to people and so much more. It's narrated by Sheikh Kamaluddin. He says, as for the virtues of Abu Ja'far al-Jawad, they did not last long for the divine fate had determined that he would stay in this world for a little while and leave for his Lord soon. So his stay was brief and his days were short. The Imam lived during the time of the Abbasid Caliphs Ma'mun and Mu'tasim. And in the time of Al-Mu'tasim, he was summoned to Baghdad from Medina and when the Imam arrived to Baghdad, the tyrant Mu'tasim placed him under a house arrest and restricted his movements and restricted those who could go and visit the Imam. He restricted the Imam from seeing his followers and his lovers and the Shia who believed in him. Yet the qualities of the Imam could not be restricted. Once there was a jurisprudential question that the jurists at the time had different opinions on. And this was in the presence of the tyrant Caliph Mu'tasim. So they called for Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. And the Imam gave them an answer that was unique to all the answers of the jurists of that time who were present. Mu'tasim himself, the Caliph, the tyrant, was himself an illiterate. So one of the jurists present by the name of Abu Dawood, he grew extremely envious and jealous of the Imam, especially that the Imam's answer was so easily accepted by Mu'tasim. So he went to Al-Mu'tasim and he slandered the Imam and he presented the Imam as a threat. And then Al-Mu'tasim decided to murder the Imam. Brothers and sisters, send your souls to Baghdad. Send your souls to Kavamiya, to the shrine of his grandfather, Imam al kadhim alayhi salam. And Imam al Jawad alayhi salam is buried next to his grandfather, Imam al kadhim There are two narrations as to how the Imam was martyred, but both narrations, they say that he was poisoned. One says that Mu'tasim used one of his ministers to poison him with food or drink that was kind of forced onto the Imam. And the other narration says that it was the wife of Imam Umm al-Fadl, who was the daughter of Ma'mun and the niece of al-Mu'tasim. And she gave the Imam some poison grapes and the Imam alayhi salam ate from them. Can you imagine the poison is affecting the body of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam? It's reacted with all parts of his body and he began suffering unbearable pains. He was in excruciating pain and he told those who were with him that the night would be his last and he would pass away. If you look at how Imam al-Jawad was in his last moments, can you think about the last moments 
in the life of his grandfather, Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. Amongst the companions of Imam al Hussein, Abu al Fadl al Abbas alayhi salam was the last to attain martyrdom on the day of Ashura. Now from Kardamain, send your soul to Karbala to the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, Qamar Bani Hashim. In these nights that we're entering of the Hajjah, these are the nights when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam interrupted his Hajj to leave towards Kufa as all the Kufans had written letters of support and love for the Imam. And the Imam is now taking his caravan towards Kufa. And on the way they were stopped in a land called Karbala. And on the 10th day of Ashura, all the men of the Ahlul Bayt and in the companions of the Imam are gone. The only man who is left standing with Aba Abdullah al Hussein is Abu al Fadl al Abbas. Abu al Fadl al Abbas, he had these distinguished characteristics that perhaps were unmatched from the companions of the Imams. One of those characteristics that have been mentioned by the Ahlul Bayt. One of them is basira, is insight, and the other is loyalty. I want to speak briefly and mention loyalty too. On the day of Ashura, can you imagine now, the camp of Imam al Hussein is without water for several days. According to the famous narration, Imam al Hussein sent Abu al Fadl al Abbas to bring water from the river Furat. There is one narration that says that Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he went along with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to get the water. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas did not go alone. So Imam al Hussein, along with his brother Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, they moved towards the banks of the Euphrates River to get some water for the women and the children of the camp. History narrates how courageous these brothers were on this day and how they fought against the enemies. Imam al Hussein, who was almost 60 years of age, but he had unmatched bravery and power. And Abu al Fadl al Abbas, who was a young man of around 30 years, with all the great characteristics that we know and love about him. These two brothers fighting shoulder to shoulder in the midst of the ocean of the enemy's army. They cut their line so they can reach the riverbank to get some water. This was their mission. It's been narrated in the middle of this fight. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he realized that his brother Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was separated from him. By this time, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he reached the river. He enters the river. It's narrated that Abu Fadl al Abbas, he filled the river, he filled the water bags to take them back to the tent. But he himself was so thirsty. He hasn't drank water for many days. His lips were dry, his tongue is dry, the heat of the desert is really affecting him. And any other person in such a condition would drink the water. There's no haram to drink that water and to quench his own thirst. And this is where Abu Fadl al Abbas, he showed his loyalty to his Imam. As soon as Abu Fadl al Abbas took some water in his palm, he remembered the thirst of his Imam. He remembered the thirst of his brother Hussein. And he says the famous words, O oh soul, you should be blamed for Hussein. You should be debased for Hussein and never live after him. 
In other words, O oh soul, why do you want to live longer and to see your Imam die before your eyes? Don't live other than the Imam, that you have served the Imam of your time. Al Hussein has come face to face with death. And yet you want to drink cold and delicious water. He's talking to his soul now. I swear upon Allah that this is not in accordance with the dictates, with the beliefs of my religion. And he drops the water from his hand. Maybe he remembered the cries of thirst from the children in the tents. So he left. And this is when the cowardly enemies attacked Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. And you know the story, I'm not going to narrate it. You will hear this story in the nights of Ashura, in the nights of the 10 nights of Muharram. And he falls to the ground and he cried out for his brother. Suddenly Imam al Hussein hears his brother's voice calling him, O oh brother, help, O oh brother. Shall we pray for the quick reappearance of our Torah Imam, Imam Sahib Al Asri Wal Zaman, who is the host of this Majlis? We pray for all the oppressed around the world, all the needy, all the sick, our Maraja the defenders of our religion, all the shuhada, and especially for the quick reappearance of our 12th holy imam, we recite Ayah Sharif Amma Yujib five times all together. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We ask Allah in the name of Imam Al Jawad. Amma Yujibul Muftarra Ida Da'ahu Yakshifusu. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 you can stand and face the Qibla for Dua Al-Faraj. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma kun li waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai fi hadhihi al-sa'a. وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وبسورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات